Hi, I'm Peggy Farron, and you're watching the Understand Photography Show, where we talk about travel, nature, and fine art photography. Today, we're going to be talking about safari, photographic safaris in Africa with Hilton Kotsa. He is a guide in South Africa who does this for a living. Um, first, I want to tell you, though, June 4th is the date for the four weeks to the four weeks to proficiency in photography. That's our signature class. Now, if you're thinking about a trip to South Africa and listen to this, this episode, you'll see that we talk a lot about learning to shoot in the manual mode, learning how to use flash. All that's covered in the four weeks to proficiency in photography. So it starts June 4th. Check it out on our website at understandphotography.com. Hilton Katza is the owner of Africa, photographic services. He, uh, his company, he's been doing it for, I think he said about 15 years, and his company specializes in anything to do with photographing in, and safaris, including doing family portraits and weddings out in the bush. But mostly he is a guide with several guides in his company. So we're going to go and talk a lot about how to prepare for and what happens on a photographic African safari. Welcome, Hilton. Hi, thank you, Peggy. Thank you for having me on the show. Thank you for, for being on the show all the way from South Africa. That's pretty exciting. Yes, yeah, we've got a wonderful country and it's lovely to talk about our country. Awesome. So give us a, a short bio about you. Okay, well, I'm a photographic tutor and photographic host. Um, I'm based in an area called White River which is very close to the Kruger National Park and the Greater Kruger, which is where most of South African safari takes place. And I have been doing this for about 15 years. I have a small company which does photographic rentals as well, and we do safari weddings and safari family portraits and photographic safaris. Wow, that, that sounds so much fun. What, what is, is it not fun when the weather's bad? Do you lose money? <laughs> I just thought of that. <laughs> well, luckily in South Africa, the weather's good most of the time. So we do have a rainy season, but even on a rainy safari, you can still get fantastic shots. So um, the safaris still happen. Uh, the safari companies are very geared, the lodges are very geared towards having um, ponchos and being out there in the rain, we take a little bit extra precaution with the cameras and the lenses, and uh, we go out and we get some fantastic nice shots. Um, nice thing about shooting in the rain is you can get that dappled drizzle in the background, which if you're shooting at a slow shutter speed, it blurs the background and you get these streaks in the background, and you've got a nice image of an impala or an animal or a lion. That sounds really cool. I'll tell you, when we first started talking, I was very excited because I like that you try a lot of different things, not, not just here, get this shot, have a fast shutter speed, but hey, try a panning or whatever. You, that was something that I got very excited after talking to you. <laughs> yeah, the, the, one of the nice things about being on safari, well, it's a challenging thing and a nice thing is that we don't have control over any of the elements and we don't have control over the animals. So you've got to be very adaptable in your shooting styles when you're out on safari. For instance, if we are out on a day and it's overcast and cloudy, it doesn't mean we can't take pictures. It just means that we adapt our shooting style and possibly then go for high key images where we're going to convert them into black and white and blow out the backgrounds. Uh, we can do a lot of panning on overcast days because it's, that what makes the image is the motion blur. It's not the golden light that makes the image. So you just have to, as a photographic tutor or a photographic host, you have to be adaptable to your environment and what nature is presenting to you on the day. Okay. So, so let's go back to the beginning. So is there a best time of year to come to South Africa? All the time. <laughs> so tell me about the different seasons when, and yeah, what's good so, at what season. So from a, well, I'm, I'm speaking from a safari point of view. Okay. That's, that's, in, that's what I want to hear. 
<laughs> so, you want to so there are different seasons for different uses, but from a safari point of view, I would say the best time to come to South Africa is from about mid-March through to October, November. Um, those are the best times to come to South Africa. In our rainy season, when you're out in the bush, there are a lot of bugs that come out. And I have noticed that first world country people don't really like bugs when they're out on safari. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, I'm bringing I'm bringing people from Florida. We we know bugs. <laughs> you know bugs. We have yes. I think 250 different species of mosquitoes in Florida. Oh wow, yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, and, and but then that's fine. So you'll, you'll be you'll be used to that. Um, but in our rainy season, it is the most beautiful time in the bush because everything is green, everything is luscious. Um, but you do have to contend with sporadic thunder showers and maybe a rainy day or two uh, but that doesn't mean you won't enjoy your safari but if you don't enjoy bugs then don't come in the summer especially so what, if you're going sorry what months are those from march through to uh yeah end of october mid-october is a great time but our rainy season starts around about uh, mid-november through to mid-march Okay. Okay. So yeah. So because you're the opposite of us. Yeah, you'll have the end of the rainy season in mid March. Okay. Okay. All right. So, what's is there different? Like you know, we're coming in. What am, I can't remember now. We're coming in late September, early October of 2020. Yes. And the reason that we chose that time was because I guess the watering holes are drying up. That's right. So it's the end of the dry season. So the animals tend to congregate around the water holes where there is still water sources. So your possibility of finding game easier is quite good because you know animals are going to drink at least once a day, maybe twice a day. Okay. So once you know where the water holes are or if you're on a riverine area, those are the areas that you stick to because that's where the game tends to congregate. Okay. So what about what, what about if I'm really into landscape photography? When is the best time? I mean, I think most people come to Africa in general, the entire continent for the game, right? For the game, yes. But the landscapes yeah. are beautiful too. There, there's some very beautiful landscapes in South Africa. However, they're not in the reserve areas. Okay. So um, we've got, uh, sorry, I just want to get that away for you. We've got um, the Blyder Canyon, we've got Cape Town, Cape uh, uh, Table Mountain, uh, we've got the Cedarberg, which is beautiful, we have nice sunrise and stuff. It's not a wildlife area, so those are great for, for landscape areas, but in, in the reserves, if you're on safari, your focus is going to be on animals. Uh, there are some areas that are really beautiful with riverines and mountain ranges and what we call Kopis, which are little hills, rolling hills with uh, great vegetation on. Um, and they do make for nice landscapes. Uh, but typically, if you're a serious landscape photographer and you're going to shoot a sunrise, that's the time that you're out on safari looking for animals as well. So you kind of like mm -hmm. got to get a, a balance on are you going to look for animals because there's only a specific area in the reserves that you can you can look for animals you can't find these animals at cape town or anywhere like that right and the other challenge that we do have is that generally you're not allowed to get out of the vehicle because you're getting out into a potential area where lions leopards and elephants are so um with the guides of the lodges that we travel with we can organize that we can get out of the vehicle and they will have all their safety measures in place that if an elephant or a lion or a leopard or something walks past, we would be uh, ushered into the vehicle and your camera equipment will stay outside until the animal is passed and then we'll go back and photograph the landscape or a tree or even stars. Stars is quite nice at night. Oh. Especially, yes, yeah, it's very, very nice. Especially what? What time of year? 
usually out in 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 the winter periods because then we don't have rain and clouds and so on and obviously we've got to time it with the cycles of the moon um if you've got full moon it's not really going to be a a nice picture because you decimate the stars but um depending on our moon cycles you can do that and there's That's some lovely dead trees that are always out in the bush that you can use as a subject and then we often use the spotlights to paint with light oh wow that sounds so fun <laughs> oh, how exciting all right so let's back up so okay so i've decided when i'm going to come mm -hmm. and let's say i'm a beginner photographer because let me just tell you what happens to me very very often i get a call yes. on the phone because i've been i've had the training center for 10 years now I get yes. a call on the phone. I'm going to Africa next week. What kind of camera should I buy? <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> next week? Okay. So, I mean, you need more preparation than that yes. if you're if you're a brand new photographer, would you say? Most definitely. So what would be the steps to, let's say that I'm a brand new photographer, but I have a whole year before I go to Africa. What should I be doing to prepare? Well, I need to know what kind of gear to bring, to buy, because I don't have any gear yet. And yes. what do I need to learn before I go? It, let's say you have a whole year. Well, my first, my first step would be to somebody, if they say to me, I'm going to Africa, uh, what should I be taking with? Um, I would say they would get, they, they'd need to get in contact with somebody like you. My first question is, do you understand photography or not? You know, do you know what a shutter speed and an aperture and an ISO is? And if the question is no, I shoot on the green button, then I would say, well, you need to get to somebody like Peggy so that they could do a basic photography course with you. One of the saddest things that I experience with people that come from over from over the waters and international guests that come on safari is that exact thing that some of the people buy their camera at the airports yeah. and I they take that. it out of the box in South Africa and they in this five or six day safari it is something that I, I, I can't explain it to you um, you have no idea of how many pictures you're actually going to take on safari because it's so overwhelming and nobody can explain this to you until you've experienced it you know, we have people that say, wow, I never knew I was going to take so many so many pictures or I wish I had bought a camera because I only got my cell phone. And it's it's a once in a lifetime experience. So you've got to be prepared for it if you want to capture the moment when you're on safari. So I would do a basic photography course um, with people like yourselves. I'm sure there's a lot of institutions in the US that, that do things like that and get an understanding of your ISO, your shutter, and your, ap uh, your aperture. Because those are the three components that determine what your image is going to look like in the end. And then an understanding of your camera, which button is where, what this button does. Uh, and that takes probably a month or two months of you playing around with your camera and having somebody who is knowledgeable share little nuances and treats with you as it were on how your camera works and how to get the best image I, so uh, that, would, that would be my first step i think i think that you know the first we have a class called the four weeks to proficiency in photography and it's an online it's a it's an online class it's interactive though there's homework and yeah. things like that but the first thing we teach is how to shoot in the manual mode so that they do understand iso shutter speed and aperture you don't know how many people come to me after taking classes for 10 years and no one has ever taught them how to shoot. For some reason, most no. of the teachers teach everyone to shoot an aperture priority and then they never really learn. They don't really understand the relationship between those three components because they just understand aperture and nothing else. So nothing else, yeah. I'm happy to hear you saying this. Makes me makes me happy. <laughs> Uh, it's very, okay, so it's very important. It's very important to understand that relationship because, as I've mentioned before, we don't have control over the elements that we use. And um, I just want to move you up there. There we go. We don't have control over the elements. And when you're on Safari, there is 
things that happen on the spur of the moment. An elephant runs out of a bush, a leopard walks out onto the road, and we don't have time to say, set your aperture at this, set your shutter speed at this, this is what we want to capture. It's got to be second nature to you. And so that's why it's wait. important when you're out in the bush over there that you already understand the relationship between those three those three fundamental elements that make up the photograph. So if you have a whole year, you should start right now. June June 4th is the next class for the four weeks of proficiency, by the way, and it's online. Okay. <laughs> um, start right away and then put it, you know, schedule it on your on your calendar to practice. Yeah. Practice at least three, four times a week, even if it's 15 minutes, right? Get uh, yeah. familiar, like you said, get familiar with the camera, get familiar with your settings and get out there and shoot so you can practice. Okay, so what kind of gear do we need? Well, this depends on what your budget is, of course. As you know, <laughs> um, we, we've got entry-level cameras, we've got uh, sort of um, prosumer cameras, and then we've got professional cameras. And this definitely depends on the budget that somebody has, uh, but an, a sort of a mid-entry level camera would be a good, a good camera to start with. Um, I know a lot of people are talking about, at this stage, mirrorless cameras. Um, I'm not sure what, what an entry level price would be in the US, but I know in South Africa they look at prices of around about between 12,000 and 18,000 Rand, which if I have to do a very quick calculation, it's around about $1,800 for a camera. Okay. And normally you get a kit with that. So you'll get a 1855 lens with that or a 28300 lens, which are very basic lenses, but they will do the job if you're not too fussy about your pictures. Okay. If you've reached a level where you are um, a little bit more picky about the quality of your pictures, you'd be going over onto uh, sort of prime lenses and more expensive lenses. So I think you are pretty much aware of the fact that if somebody says to you, what do I buy when I buy camera equipment? And always the first thing is buy good glass. Or in America, buy good glass. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty good. <laughs> oh, I used so to say- So lens is always very important. And, um, you know, if you've got a 2.8 lens, and a lens that can drop to an aperture of 2.8, you are going to pay more for that lens, but you are going to get a better quality image in the end. So, all right. So, so what, we, is, what, is one, what is one take on Safari? Entry, a middle, middle of the range camera, I would say. So, a camera that can handle ISOs that can go up to sort of um, 800, 1,200 and... Uh, maybe 1600 ISO without producing too much noise in the picture. All right. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I'm saying that is often when you're on Safari, when the sun is busy setting, you have a lot of predator activity and you need an ISO that you can bump up a bit to get that extra shutter speed so that you can capture a lion or a leopard walking. And the lower end cameras battle a bit on the noise with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So camera wise, whether it's a Canon or a Nikon, I know the, the Nikon range, the D5300s and the D5600s, have got a reasonable ISO capability. And in Canon, I know in Canon in the US, our models aren't the same because okay. in South Africa it would be a, uh, a, a seven a D a seven a seven D, but it would be called perhaps a Rebel XT in the US. So I'm not 100 percent sure how those no, how those camera brands. We have a seven D and a seven D Mark II, so maybe. Yeah, yeah. I know the and then, Rebels are different because you. In South Africa, there's a 70 D and an 80 D, but those are called Rebels, or there's a 6 D, which is a full frame for for Canon. Um, That's the same. It's the same. The same over there. The okay. rebel, the rebel here is called like a T6 or a T7, where I think the rebel, at least in Europe, it's called a 550. I think. I don't know. Anyway, yeah. whatever. Rebel's a rebel. Any any one of those are are a good choice 
Uh, and then on the lens side, you want to have a lens that's got a little bit of, of reach. So anywhere up to a 300, 400 millimeter reach would be sufficient in the South African Sabi Sands reserves area. Uh, with the private reserves, the vehicles are allowed to go off-road. So you'd be driving along dirt roads and we'd spot a leopard which is out in the bush or in the savanna and they would physically go off the road and drive through the bush over trees and shrubs to get to the leopard. And you would probably be, um, I think it's in terms of, uh, you, you, you don't speak in terms of meters, you speak in terms of yards, hey? But we, but we do millimeters on the lens, so. Yeah, that's right, yeah. that's true. You can so, do meters, I think they can handle 20 meters. meters away, 20 meters away from an animal. That's more or less the comfort zone distance that the lodges are allowed to park to, the, to animals without okay. them getting scared and moving off and so on. So 20 meters away, between 10 and 20 meters, which I don't know how much that equates to yards, but it's um, it's quite close. So you don't need a 600 millimeter lens or you, unless you're doing birds, then you do. Okay, so if I bring my 150 to 600, I've got that Sigma for yeah. my Canon, that you think that's, that's too much? No, that would be perfect for you. Because okay. you've got reach from 160. 160. So you'd be shooting most of the range that you're going to be shooting at is between 160 and about 250, 300. That would be the range that you would be shooting at. Unless you're doing creative shots or detailed shots where uh, you're shooting just the eye of a lion or the paw or the ear, then you would zoom into 600. What so about it's nice, nice versatility. Since we are going to a private reserve, would it be better for me to bring my 70 to 300? It's an L series lens. It's a nice lens and it doesn't that, weigh as much. Yes. Or would it be I better to have that. the 150 to 600 on a full frame? On a full frame. I, I, me per personally, I would prefer the, the, the 300 milli, the L lens, okay. um, because you are going to get close to the animals. So that's what I would do. If, if it was me. Um, well, it's a lot easier to handle. It is, yes. So uh, that's the lens that I would bring. Okay. Always and if I, need a, uh, if I need a long lens, I can just rent it from you. That's correct. Yes, okay. you don't have to lug it all the way over from, from over the US, <laughs> over the <Okay>. waters. <laughs> and how much does that cost about to, let's say I wanted to rent, you know, what if I'm a birder and I wanted to rent, do you, do you have like a 150 to 600? Do you, do you rent those, the Sigmas that yeah, are we, so popular right now? Yeah, we do have them. Tam okay. There's Tamron, the G2 is a very good lens. Um, so the how new much bird. would that be for a, a week? Or is that, is a normal well, safari about a week? A, it works on a per day. Your safari is five days. And okay. um, it would it would be more or less in the region of 500 rand, which is probably about fifty dollars for whole five days. No, no, per day. Per oh, day. oh, I was gonna yeah. say, whoa, I'm not bringing any equipment. <laughs> yeah. So fifty dollars a day times five is yeah, about two hundred fifty dollars for a for a week. Yeah. But to not have to carry that big lens to me, that sounds perfectly that acceptable. Is, yeah. Yeah. Do you rent everything? Do you rent cameras and? We rent whole... everything from cameras to lenses. From our lenses are 600. We have 600 lenses. We have 300 2.8. We have a full range. Uh, on the website, which is Africa Photographic Services, there's a button called Photographic Rentals, and you'd be able to see the full range of what is available over there. Okay, that's so cool. And does it so convert the money for you? Sorry? Does it convert the money for you? If I go on your website, will I be able to figure out how much it'll actually cost? No, unfortunately not. We, we do have a converter that gives you a, a ballpark figure, but a lot of the times, um, Peggy, you must, you must realize that the, the price on the, on the website is just for the rental of the equipment. So once you're out in South Africa, you'll understand there's quite a lot of logistics of getting that lens to the end client. Oh, and we need to know 
Yeah, we need to know when you're flying in, where you're flying to, what reserves you're going to, what lodges you're going to, because there are four or diff yeah, about four different ways of you actually getting to the lodge. And we have to work out the most cost-effective way to get the equipment to you. Ah, okay. Sometimes, sometimes we will meet you in Oatambo in Johannesburg and hand you the lens. Oh, and that's... a lot of the time, you'll, you'll, your international flight will land in, in Oatambo, which is Johannesburg. Then you would, there's one or three ways that you would transfer from there further. The one is that you'd have a road transfer, which is not advisable. It's about a three and a half to four hour drive to get to the, the Kruger Park area. Most people hop onto a smaller, a smaller plane, which would then fly and land either at uh, Nelspreit Airport or at Skakuza Airport. Or where you're going, we're going to the Timbavati area, so you would hop onto an airlink plane which would get to the Hootspreit Airport. Right. Now, the, the Hootspreit Airport and Skakuza Airports, in terms of distance from us, uh, is only about 100 kilometers. Okay. But in terms of time, of driving there because we're driving in reserves where it's slow it um, takes us to deliver and get back to the office it takes us four and a half hours to five wow. hours to deliver a lens yes wow so there's a lot of logistics and planning that go into that a lot of the times we deliver the lens to the lodge um one of the uh, um, advantages of of our, using our companies, we're the only rental company that's based close to all the lodges. So we don't bill for the days that you're not using the lens. All right. So in one of the lodges, it's called Sangita La Bomba. It's in the Kruger Park. It's a seven hour drive to get to the lodge. Wow. Where we are. All right. So we would, with um, Sangeeta also has a lodge in the Sabi Sands. We would send the, the lens to the Sabi Sands Lodge. They have a courier that they pay for that goes for between the lodges. And we would sometimes send a lens a week before the client needs it so that it gets to Sangeeta La Bombo in time. And we don't bill for those times. We only bill for the period that you are at the lodge using the lens. Wow, that's so complicated compared to what they do here. <laughs> yes, I know. All the other rental companies, if it leaves the shop, you start paying. Exactly. And when it's back, you stop paying. Now, so what if, we work what if, different. Okay, so what if um, we hire you as our guide? Does that save us money in the lens rental because you'll be with us? Uh, it, it will save the transport cost. The delivery cost, yes. So I would bring the delivery cost up. Yeah. Okay. So that's a good tip. <laughs> good tip. <laughs> <laughs> well, book, just book us as guides, and then you'd have a free delivery. <laughs> there you go. It's, I like it. This is what I'm doing. <laughs> All right. So so now let's talk to me. So what am I going to bring for my? I've got a 6D. I don't have the 6D Mark II because it's not as good in low light as the old 6D, the Canon. I believe it is, yeah. Which is so strange. Why would they do that? I don't understand. But anyway, so I have my old 6D as my favorite camera right now. All right. And then um, God only knows what I'll have in another year because I'm using right now a 60D as my backup, and that's an old camera. I can't. I can go to 1600 ISO, but I do get noise, so I'll probably have a yeah. different, but a crop frame. So yes. what should I bring? I have a lot of gear. Okay, let me just start there. <laughs> your, your cameras, we've, we've determined your cameras. What lenses do you have? You've got the 160 to 600. 150 to 600, I've got that. Uh, I've got this. Oh. My two, my two or three, well, I don't know. I'll just tell you some of the different lenses I have. Because for work, as events and portraits, I use yeah. mostly my 24 to 70 2.8 yeah. and my 70 to 300, which is an f4. I used to have the 70 to 200 2.8, but I am too old to carry that damn thing. It's too heavy. <laughs> <laughs> so those are my two main lenses. But I, my usually the lens I travel with the most is the 24 to 105. Yeah. 
The 24105 is great for general photographs on Safari, but you do need a little bit of an extra reach when it comes to the animals to get a nice detailed shot of an animal. So I always recommend to people that they bring a general wide angle, either 2470 or 24105 lens. Uh, in the Nikon range, you've got the same 2470, and then there's a 20, 24120, which which Nikon has got, which is quite a nice a quite a nice lens. And then in their in their cheaper lenses, and I think Canon has also got that 18. 18, uh, 50, not the 1855, the 28300. Okay. It's not a bad ring as well. It gives you quite a lot of versatility. Uh, for you, I would suggest you bring your, your L lens, your your 300, and your 24105. And I think between those two lenses, you're going to pretty be pretty well sorted. And I don't need a, like an L No. Because I've got you like a 17 to 40. All my most of my lenses are L series because that's I know better. I buy I have my cameras are old, but my my lenses are oh, nice. Good God. Yes. <laughs> uh, if we're going to do landscapes and nightscapes and stars, then I would bring the the 1740. Okay. Yeah. So but then you which, don't need to bring the 24105. Okay, that's what I was going to ask. If I what so would your, be better than 20? Sorry to sorry to interrupt, but your 1740 will do your general pictures of your groups, and it will do one or two sunsets, and it will do maybe you, you know you might even want to take some shots of the lodges. Yeah. Oh you know, yeah, the, they look beautiful. Yes. So that would be your 1740. Okay. All right. 1740 is not necessarily the right lens for stars at night. It is or it is not. No, it isn't. What would the yeah. star? What would the lens for stars at night be? The the um, the seven the seventeen forty would be. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Sorry, I misunderstood you. Okay, yeah. okay. So, all right. So those are my lenses. I'm going to bring two camera bodies, at least two lenses. What yeah. other kind of gear do I need? Um. The lodges supply, most of the lodges supply quite hefty bean bags that you can brace your, your camera on. Okay. Uh, some of the lodges like Makani have actually got special support gear on the vehicles, so that wouldn't be a problem. Um, the lenses that you use, if there is a foot plate on the lens, then you, then, then you would just for safety's sake, bring a foot piece with, because sometimes the lodges lose their foot pieces, okay. and so they've, got the, they've got the support for them, for you to put your camera on, but they don't have the foot piece and the foot plate, you know, the, okay. the base plate. Yeah. Uh, if we're going to do stars, and we're going to do some stalls, then you would need a, a nice sturdy tripod. A travel tripod is fine. However, having said that, we have done star photography where we've uh, shot a nice tree with stars in the background. And in South Africa, we get the Milky Way. You can see the Milky Way quite nicely. Um, we've done that off a bean bag. Wow. So, uh, so you get very low down. Um, and the reason for that being obviously is that you want the horizon as close to the tree base as possible. Otherwise, you know, the tree is cut in half. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. So we can, okay. we have done that with a bean bag before. And but you do you rent the tripods? Yes, we do tripods. We do all the support systems as well. Okay. Monopods, tripods. We do have a monopod with um, uh, it's a uh, it's a head called a DJ90 head. So it has a swivel action only in one direction, vert uh, forward and backwards. All right. The sideways swivel action would be in your wrist, where you just twist the monopod from one side to the other side. If I have found that when you have a ball head and you loosen the ball head so that you can maneuver your lens, if your lens is quite heavy, it will sometimes dip to the side of the ball head. So we always suggest a monopod which only has a, a lateral movement action and the the twisting will happen in your wrist 
because okay. you, you move around on the vehicle when you're moving in terms of photographing something. Uh, a tripod on a vehicle is nice if you're the only person on the vehicle, but if there's a lot of people on the vehicle with you, your you move around the tripod to get space, so you're moving into somebody else's space. Whereas if you've got a monopod, you can move the monopod without you moving around the tripod. I mean, I think you. I hope I'm explaining myself. No, you're, this is great. I mean, the, but this is why we decided to go to Macanye because they've got the they've, they've got, got all the vehicles yeah. equipped, so we don't have yeah. to worry about it in the vehicles. But anywhere else, we would have to, right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. We do have a lot of stuff that we can take with. Um, you know, we get for photographic safari. So we have got brackets and arms, and you'll see on our website um, all the stuff that we do have. Okay. But Makani is geared for that. Uh, there are a couple of other lodges that also are geared for that. Very, very geared for photographic stuff like Londolozi. And um, they, they normally would sort the guests out as long as they know in advance that it's a photographic group coming yeah yeah okay that's awesome any any other equipment like do we need filters or um i don't know yeah. what else oh, we, need a, a we need a um a remote, cable. Uh, no no you, no you don't need a remote trigger for bulb um our settings typically when we're shooting stars at night would be a 30 second exposure and your aperture would be as small as possible so if it's f4 or 2.8 um, and then your iso would be depending on the type of camera that you have anywhere between 400 and 1250 iso and then it would also be depend on the time of the evening um, of how how much luminance there is in 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 the air at night mm -hmm. Which will affect what ISO we use. Okay. So there's no necess it's not necessary for a for a for a remote trigger. Oh, that's good to know. That's interesting. I always tell people that if you are going to use one, buy the kind with the cord because yeah. they work. We yes. spend we waste so much time helping our customers with those electronic ones that never seem to work. Yeah. <laughs> or they're so complicated you can't figure them out. Yeah. So with we, the cord are like ten dollars, just buy that one. Just buy them. I mean, it's fine if somebody brings that and you've got that with them. Uh, we often improvise if we are in a situation where we need to get some time before the photograph is taken. We put the the camera on timer and we put it on a five second timer, and then it would take the picture. It's the same as having a cable release. Right. Okay. All right. So I feel good about the equipment. Am I missing anything? Uh, the only thing that you possibly would want to bring with is an external flash. Oh. How much flash do we use? Well, it depends on how comfortable you are with flash. So why would I'm we the, need a flash? I'm the flash queen, man. Are you the flash queen? Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> so why would we need a flash on Safari? Often there are scenarios where you've got a leopard lying up in a tree and the tree is creating shade on the leopard. Okay. So you'd use flash as a full in to get the glint in the eye. So even during the day? Even during the day. Yes. Do you use one of those better beamers to shoot the... Do you know what that I, is? I don't. I don't, but I've got a powerful flash. Um, okay. But uh, we do have better beamers for people, so it depends on the strength of your flash. Okay. Uh, but I don't use a better beamer. Um, I just use a normal flash. Um, do the settings on the camera. We're shooting manual. Uh, we're pushing the flash uh, to its furthest extent, and it normally does the job. Okay. What, what makes a wildlife picture is the glint in the eye. Okay. So yeah. if you think about any postcard of wildlife, the, the basic principle is we want subject separation from the background. And you want a glint in the eye. If you can see the eye sharp, doesn't matter about the rest of the body, it's going to be a good picture. Okay. I think I sent you some pictures. There's a, there's a male lion lying looking sideways. I think I sent that picture to you. Um, the eye sharp, 
and it shot at a very a very um, low f-stop so it's shot at 2.8 and then from the nose of the line it starts going blurred and you can see these body which is also blurred but it's still a very nice pleasing picture because the eye is sharp so in wildlife photography you're looking for subject separation from the background and you're looking for a sharp eye and then the rest of the picture just falls into place composition is important and everything like that but the rest of the picture just falls into place okay well, that is, that's great advice so what what does a typical day look like on a safari a photographic right, safari a photographic safari right depending on on what time of the year we go on safari um your your times of leaving the lodge would differ so in summer you wake up a lot earlier because it gets so hot you're back at the lodge at around about half past eight in the morning and then you have what they call a brunch breakfast brunch the rest of the day is yours on a normal safari on a photographic safari we get out the laptops and we get out the, the computers we download we discuss the images we go through post-processing um, a lot of people might want a little bit of extra tuition on how their camera works or their flash um, then there's a, a period around about between one and two where there's a lunch period with the lodges and then there's a siesta time after that to about 3 3 30 back up for high tea at the main deck at about 3 30 and out on safari again until about seven half past seven at night okay so you get up before sunrise so you're out there yes and that's that correct. in the sunrise and sunset that's when the animals are coming out the most the predators are active then okay yeah the predators are active so the predators are generally active during the night it's not that you're not going to see predators during the day but uh leopards which are very shy animals would sort of tend to um when the sun comes up and is out they would start going to hide and sleep and so on like that for the day and that's why i said winter is also a nice period to come because of the cooler air they are active a lot longer into the day ah that's a good point yeah. and you're not going to have quite a big gap in the middle of the day you're not going to have a big gap in the middle of the day yeah okay all right but i like the idea of taking a siesta every day <laughs> 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 I think that sounds really nice. <laughs> um, yeah, all right, it, let me see. It, does, it, does, it, does, it becomes a very long day, and people don't realize that because, as photographers, we want to capture that golden light area. So, we've got to be out on safari early so that we can look for the animals. Once we've found the animals, hopefully, we've got the light timing right and we shoot in the golden light. And then you go back to the lodge and then in the evening is the same thing you know when the sun's setting round about between four o'clock and six o'clock is our golden golden light area okay of where we're looking for those animals but there's no guarantees in the bush you sometimes have a packed safari of animals and sometimes you see one animal okay of course yeah yeah what about um what kind of animals in Okay, so you're in the Kruger National. Well, let, let, let me ask you this first. What's the difference between a public and a private game reserve? Because Kruger National okay. Park, you hear about that all the time. And we are going there, but we're going on a private reserve. So what's what's the difference? Okay, so the Kruger National Park is like, in our country, it's like one of the seven wonders. It is a really big tourist attraction. Like in the US, it would be, the Statue of Liberty or um, I think out in Colorado you've got um, the canyons near Las Vegas the they're, they're big tourists yeah the Grand Canyons they, they, they're big they're big tourist attractions um, so Kruger National Park is one of those tourist attractions but it is a public park which means it's cheaper it's more accessible to everybody you can drive around in your own car in the park but you're not allowed to go off-road okay so if you're driving around in the park and you see an animal in the bush if it's 100 or 200 meters off that's as close as what you're going to get to it okay. all right 
in the private reserves. Oh, and the other thing is that in, in the Kruger National Park, they don't really limit the amount of vehicles in a sighting because it's public. Okay. You could end up with a leopard sighting with probably 20, 30 cars standing on the road. It becomes it becomes a traffic jam oh. if it's a lion or a leopard sighting. It really does become a traffic jam. Okay. Whereas at the private reserves, you're not allowed to drive around in your own vehicle. Everything is sand roads. There's no tar roads in the private reserves. Um, so it's a very more bu authentic bush experience. Okay. Um, their vehicles are geared to go off-road. They're four by four vehicles. So they go off-road, ride over logs, ride over rocks, ride in sand, river beds, and you can follow the animals through the bush. So the experience is a lot more authentic. So if you pick up a leopard walking on a road and he decides to get off the road and walk through the bush, you can follow him through the bush. We're in the, in the, in the, uh, in the Kruger Park public area. You can't do that. Ah, so you're, you're, I know, I, I, I had a, a woman on my show who does tours in, in Kruger and she, you know, she was talking about that they have to get there so early because it's so crowded and I thought, that doesn't sound like fun to me. No. I don't like crowds. I do want to say to you though, Peggy, that you do need to experience a Kruger safari as well, because it is a totally different safari. But when you go, your mind has to be right. You must realize you're going to sit in a queue to watch a leopard, but you're driving yourself. It is There's a sense of adrenaline and adventure when you're driving yourself and there's a big elephant in front of you on the road. There is a sense of, of, of um, adrenaline and adventure in that. What I, what I just wanted to say about the private safaris as well is that you've got your guide and ranger that are, say, are, are, are sharing information with you all the time. Okay. So in the Kruger, you've got two options. You can go with a guided safari like this lady does guided safaris in the Kruger. So you'd get onto her vehicle, but she's also not allowed to go off-road. And she would drive you through all the possible roads that there are, and she would share information with you. Or you could drive in your own car, and then you're not, you'll see an elephant, but nobody's going to tell you that an elephant's gestation period is 24 months or 22 months, um, that it's got over 5 million muscles in its trunk. Uh, nobody's going to tell you that if it's feeding while it's looking at you, it's relaxed. Nobody's going to tell you that it's mock feeding, that it is contemplating what should it do. Nobody's going to tell you that when you're on your own. Okay. I want somebody to guide me. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and then what were you going to say about the, because you told this to me earlier about the guides on the private reserve, they have a, a driver who is called. A guide. The ranger. A guide. Yeah, the the guide. ranger. Yes, and then they have a tracker. Okay. So the tracker sits right in the front of the vehicle on a special seat that's made for him. And his job is to spot the animals. So your ranger would be communicating with you. So he'd be sitting driving, watching the road. He also looks for signs of animals. But your tracker sits in the front and he'll watch the dirt road as they go and he'll pick up tracks. They are very highly skilled. They know how long ago the animal has walked there. They'll say this animal is walking in that direction. Um, it's basically like, um, you know, you know, that you, you've got the movies Miami CSI and CSI Miami or CSI New York, all right? This whole detective story. So when you go out on safari, I call it CSI safari. <laughs> you've got to pick up clues. From, from the African bush as to what animals have been there and where they're going and how we can try and intercept them and see them. Okay. I call it CSI Safari. So in the mornings when you go out, there's a whole story that's happened at night of animals chasing, walking over the roads, um, lions or leopards marking their territories, and these trackers will look at tracks and they'll say this was a territorial boundary walk or this was a territorial fight over here or 
this leopard has come over from that property and they don't know that footprint. It's a new leopard in the area. Wow. Yeah. And it's wow. very interesting. They're very talented. And, and, and in South Africa, the tracker that sits at the, at the front of the vehicle in the, in the African culture, he has the same status as a doctor. Very highly regarded. It's a very, a very highly regarded profession, yes. Oh, that's awesome. That's so cool. I'm so excited. So if you can afford it, it's definitely better to go private. Definitely, yes. Okay. All right. What 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 do we need to prepare for like before we go? Do we have to take like malaria what malaria tablets or something? Do you know any of that kind of stuff? I know that's not really related to photography, but I know we don't need a visa to come to South Africa. I yeah, believe we can either. come with just our passport. That's right, yes. Um, when it comes to prophylactics, that is everybody's personal choice. And your doctor in the US or your personal doctor is probably going to advise you to take some. Okay. And it would be a good idea to take some. However, having said that, we live in the area permanently. I don't take any prophylactics. I've been 15 years in the bush and I've never had malaria. Okay. So if there are certain, all that I do is I take precautions for malaria. And the malaria mosquito is mainly active sort of in the crepuscular time of day as the sun's setting. And it's a very small little malaria um, mosquito, Nopheles, and it, it can't do well in wind. It doesn't okay. operate when there's a wind or anything like that. So... I, your your lodge that you go to will normally have a fan above the bed, so you just put the fan on and it creates that wind so that the mosquitoes can't operate in the area over the bed if there are anything. And then there, in South Africa, there's um, uh, like a spray called a mosquito spray, which has a citronella-based oil on it, mm -hmm. which gives off that citronella smell, and that's normally a very big deterrent for for mosquitoes. Okay. What about, do you use bug jackets? Um, sorry, say that again? Bug jackets. Bug jackets. Um, are you just talking about a normal jumper no. or one that's sprayed? Because I know like Craig Harpers and so on, they've got, they've got a special spray they put on their bugs, their jackets, and it's, it's, it's maintained are... in a way. It keeps These away are, bugs. Yeah, they're treated, and yes, they and then yeah. they have you know the very thin mesh, and yeah. you know we have I told you we have 250 species of mosquitoes, but we also have no seams, which are little yeah. sand flies that bite that yeah. you can't see. All right. And so those of us who like to hike in the Everglades, we have bug gear <laughs> because right. we've got some bugs. Bug gear. Here. Bug gear would work. It would work definitely in, in the summer summer months over here. Um, I don't have bug gear. I have normal clothes and I spray with a citronella spray and I've never had malaria. Okay. Because like I, you know, for me, our season is the winter, which is the opposite for you. But so it starts slowing down in May. And that's when I get a day off. I mean, I don't get a day off from, you know, it's just so busy. So that's when I go hiking is when, you know, yeah. peak mosquito time and peak just so peak we wear time. we wear a buff. All right. And nets and bug jackets and hats. And <laughs> that's, it's that's, nasty that's overdoing down it in winter over here. <laughs> but I do want to say that if you go to the Okavango Delta, because it's a water mass, it's the same as the Everglades. The bug, the bug intensity is the same in the Okavango Delta in the summer months, which is from December in the Okavango Delta through to March, April, okay. where they have rain. Then the, the bug intensity would be the same as in the Everglades. In the summer. It's not and bad you need in the to winter. Be aware of that. Yeah, you need to be aware of that because a lot of people don't like, you're on an open vehicle. And while you're driving at night, the, bu the bugs are hitting you every now and again. They, they gravitate towards light. So you've got a vehicle with these spotlights in front. 
So they gravitate towards that. So um, you need to be aware of that. All right. Is there anything? What else did we miss? Because we we actually we we're pretty much out of time. What did we miss? Oh uh, well, um, I'm not too sure. Um, I, one thing I do want to say is that if you come to Africa, it is an experience that nobody can explain to you before you've experienced it. Doesn't matter what I say to you, how wonderful it is, how special it is, you will you won't understand it and grasp the the intensity of it until you've been here. And I don't know how many people you've met that have done a safari that have tried to explain to you what a safari is. And it's just like, oh yeah, I'm listening to what you're saying until you get here. It is just overwhelming. Well, I and know too. I would too love for everybody to experience that at least once in their life. Two of the ladies who, as soon as I announced our trip, two of them yeah. who have been to South Africa, even oh, really? were like, they jumped right on it. They're like, I'm going again. So there we go. <laughs> yeah, that might, that, maybe that'll be me next time, right? Hopefully, hopefully, yes. There's we, there's a saying in the safari industry. There's one bug that you must be careful of. And that's the safari bug. If that bite bites you, you're going to be back every year. So it's uh -huh. an expensive bug if it bites you because it's your <laughs> to the South African on safari. But you know what? There's so many diverse areas to go to. We're talking about South Africa at the moment. And we're talking about a specific reserve called the Timbavati. So you have the Greater Kruger. And then you have all these reserves around the, the Kruger National Park, which is the Sabi Sands Reserve the Manyaleti, the Timbavati Reserve. Those are all privately owned, but they're part of the Greater Kruger. There's no boundaries, there's no fences. The animals move freely, but we can't go from the private reserve to Kruger National Park without going through a controlled gate. But the animals can move freely. And um, then there's going up into Botswana, a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful area is the Okavango Delta. You need to experience that. Going up into Zambia, you've got the Kafui National Park and you've got um, uh, a place called Busanga Plains up in Zambia and South Luanga Valley. And then going further afield into Tanzania, you've got the Serengeti Plains, which is um, absolutely breathtaking. And then in Kenya, you've got the Masai Mara, which is beautiful, Uganda, Rwanda, you've got the lowland and highland gorillas. Um, there's so many opportunities. There's a lot of trips if the bug bites you that you need to do. <laughs> okay, all right, let's see what happens <laughs> and if I can afford it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, any last tips before I go? Your last tip was to you need to see all of Africa, it you sounds like. You really do need to see all of it. A good starting point is South Africa because it's it's um, not as remote as any of the other locations. And I think if somebody is anxious about going on safari in the bush and it's in the wild and everything, South Africa and the South African lodges are a very good starting point. Once you understand what the safari is about, you'll be adventurous to go to places like Kenya and Rwanda and the Okavango Delta. Really awesome. nice. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I think I got a lot out of this interview. I hope everybody else does too. I really appreciate your time. Now, what's your website again? Africa Photographic Services. Dot com. Com. Um, okay. Well, thank you so much for being on the Understand Photography Show. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's an honor to be here, and I hope to see you in Africa soon. Well, thank you, Hilton. I got a lot out of that, and I'm sure everyone else did. I feel like I'm much more prepared for my African safari than I was before. And of course, you already made me want to see all the other places in the in the country or the in the continent, I should say. We are doing a lot on our Ladies South Africa tour in September of 2020. We only have one opening left because we limited to just five ladies. I know that's very, very small, but it's very exclusive. It's a very exclusive trip, ladies' luxury trip. So if you like things a little bit on the 
the nicer side, you're going to love that. We have one opening left, but we're not just doing a safari. We're also going to explore South Africa. So we're going to go to Cape Town. We're going to go to the wine region. We're going to see seals and penguins and go on a whale watching boat. So check that out on our website at understandphotography.com. I'm Peggy Farron. Thanks so much for watching the Understand Photography Show. We'll see you next Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Get up!